Hello everyone, I am very excited about this video and we are going to take a look at the Hoyt Street UAV. So let's start with the obvious. The Hoyt Street UAV is a high-end, fancy, expensive electric skateboard made by a small-ish boutique company. And so naturally it is not for everyone. And in this video what I really want to highlight is not so much the specs but really what the UAV stands for as a whole. Because the Hoyt Street UAV is much, much more than just the sum of its parts. Now, if you're not familiar with Hoyt Street Skate, they are a small electric skateboard company based in Portland, Oregon, and they focus on creating relatively higher end boards with a focus on sustainable use of materials, high quality, pioneering designs, things of that nature. And through their puck remote and the parts that they list on the website for sale, they also supply the DIY community with options and value. Now, aside from the fact that the Hoyt Street puck remote has become sort of a standard mainstay in the DIY e-skate community, as well as being used in other higher end production boards, the UAV brings with it aspects of pre-built consumer electric skateboards that just haven't really been widely implemented before. And so the release of the UAV also ends up setting some newer top tier standards when it comes to production boards. Now to start with probably the most distinctive part of the UAV and that's the deck. And it's because the deck that you actually stand on as well as the enclosure encompass the entire structure of the board. It's a semi-rigid setup that is made from steam bent bamboo that is cut to shape and then is bolted through the deck through the enclosure, down into the trucks. So it creates kind of like a bamboo sandwich. Usually on an e-skate, when you have a wooden deck, you have an enclosure made of carbon fiber, fiberglass, ABS, whatever, that bolts onto the bottom of it, and the electronics, battery, and things like that are housed in there, and the structural support of the electronics tray is done entirely by the deck via inserts or mating bolts or something like that. The UAV, however, the enclosure itself becomes part of the structure of the entire board. Now, I think that the deck and enclosure is absolutely stunning. It is really one of those things that I would consider functional art. So while it lends to a very, very pleasing ride feel, lots of control at lower and higher speeds, just looking at it really, really has an effect. Now, probably the most important part of the UAV is the drivetrain. And there are multiple aspects to it that all sort of mate together and give very interesting, very premium ride feel. And when you actually look at the distinct parts of it, the amount of R&D that went into creating this assembly is very impressive. So you have custom designed reverse kingpin trucks, which in my opinion are the correct kind for a longboard, double kingpin trucks be damned, and they're machined and finished in the US. The trucks themselves have an integrated motor mount, so there's nothing to clamp on. The rear hanger is simply machined with the motor mounts on it. The motor mounts themselves house a belt drive system. Belt tension is set automatically via springs that sit inside a machined track in the motor mounts. So there's just no need to guess on belt tension or try to feel it out. You loosen the bolts, the springs set the tension, you tighten the bolts, you're good to go. And another important part of the drivetrain is the set of wheels. And the hubs and tires are purpose designed for an electric skateboard. Now that might sound like fluff, but just a little bit of backstory here. Most electric skateboard pneumatic wheels, tires, are sort of a modified type of either scooter tire or wheelchair tire. And so all the current standards as far as e-skate wheels go really just happen to be because of an offshoot of those kinds of tires. So things get adapted, things get tuned, standards almost become achieved. However, the UAV's wheels entirely depart from that. And so they designed a set of machined hubs and a corresponding tire. So the tire is their own design. They opened up their own mold and did their own testing. And so they have an actual speed rating. I will link to the information on how the tires and wheels are rated in the description below. If you want to see more information on what is, as far as I can see, the first instance of an electric skateboard having tires and wheels that are tested rigorously and given a legitimate rating. I love the tread pattern on them. Grips really, really well on both pavement, a little bit of loose grass, a little bit of dirt. It seems to just do well on most terrains. And when you actually look at the tires, the sidewalls are slightly narrower 
And what that does, at least in ride, is that if you're turning very, very hard, I mean really leaning into a carve or you're trying to make a very short turn, the wheels themselves maintain some rigidity. There are some tires, the ones on my Prototipo included, but if you really dig into a turn, you can actually feel, not, not the tire losing traction, but the sidewall starting to bend a little bit. That sideways force starts to become a bit more noticeable and it feels like you're about to break traction, even though you're not. That doesn't really happen on the UAV, no matter how hard you turn, and it's a very refreshing feeling. And the last stop on my spiel of the drivetrain is the motors. Now, I had ended up recording a clip explaining why the motors were so different on my phone to explain it to someone else. And rather than go through all that again, I'm actually just gonna cut in that explanation because it demonstrates pretty much what is so special about these motors. And when you really take in what had to be done to achieve those motors on an electric skateboard, this actually is something that no other Eastgate company has done so far. So on most electric skateboard motors and most brushless DC outrunner motors, you have a series of permanent magnets adhered to the can surrounding the inner motor windings, which are the copper wires that are energized in phases via the electronic speed controller. Now, due to the nature of the permanent magnets in the can, there is the magnetic field, which is what interacts with the energized windings of the motor. And that magnetic field is permeated through the can and which is why you have something that is ferromagnetic and it sticks to it because magnets, how do they work? Ugh. However, the magnetic field coming off of a permanent magnet is not uh, omnidirectional. It is mildly directional. And so on these motors, you have very, very little magnetic flux. The magnetic field is not very strong on the outside of the can, as opposed to on conventional motors, and that's the case with those. It is the case with these. It is the case with those. And it is the case with these as well. Now, what seems to be the case with these is that via what I can assume or guess is a mix of the shape of the permanent magnets and the way they are placed in the can and or the material of the can itself, the magnetic field of the can is directed inward minimizing the amount of the magnetic field that escapes the outside of the can. What that does is make a more efficient use of any given amount of current being cycled through the motor. Because since the magnetic field is contained within the can more, more so than on the other motors, you have a stronger magnetic pull to each motor as the windings in the motor are energized. So you would in fact have a greater torque for the same amount of current in these motors because the magnetic pull between the windings and the magnets is stronger for any given unit of current. What that means is that you can achieve the same overall power output for less current. Therefore, meaning that you can have this drivetrain via these motors run at higher power with less heat. Up until these motors, the general convention has been use larger motors to be able to dissipate more heat, which comes from using more current, which is still currently, <laughs> currently, you have the whole convention of a larger motor doesn't mean more power. It means that you can sustain more power for longer with less overheating because there is more mass to absorb the heat. And so 
rather than just continuing to make motors larger, because making motors larger will then present physical constraints when it comes to the mechanical layout of the motor and things like that. Instead of doing that, what they seem to have done is make more efficient use of the current so you get more power out of smaller motors because you don't end up with as much heat and so you don't need the mass to dissipate the heat. Now at this point in the video, I will mention the specs. It is a 12S4P battery configuration made of Mollus LP 42A cells and that battery pack is made in house. I know the guy who makes it, He's a very talented and skilled builder. I've learned a lot from him over the years, and so I would no doubt trust anything that that guy builds. The battery runs into a LaCroix Stormcore, which is a VESC-based ESC. The remote is naturally a Hoyt Street Puck with a bamboo shell, and at the front of the board is a cute little battery meter with little holes milled out for the LEDs to pop through. Now, the reason that I left the specs for all the way back here in the video is because it's also important to note that specs do not an entire electric vehicle make. Sure, we'll go with that. There's a trend in the PEV world and quite honestly everywhere where a spec sheet is the main marketing force behind a product. And what the specs don't often tell you is the actual quality of that product. How is it built? How is robustness, repairability, and longevity factored into the design? Not only what is the track record of support from the company, but how effective are they in carrying out that support system? And when it comes to things like the battery configuration and the ESC being used, is the battery and ESC arranged, built, and configured in a way where you're actually taking advantage of the types of cells being used in said battery pack? Sometimes you'll actually see a product of a certain spec that purports to offer a certain level of performance. However, the scaffolding and accoutrement of said product is not made in such a way that it can handle what the specs would imply, nor would it likely be that it's still running at that performance level in one or two years from now. And these are things that are not easily marketed or discernible. What does the weld quality in the battery look like? What is the structural support? What is the cross-section of the conductors? These are things that, for the most part, a consumer just has to trust are being done properly, and in many cases, for the sake of reaching certain price points, they're not done properly. And so when you factor in specs, it's important to make it only one piece of the puzzle when you're looking at an entire product. On with the spec sheet, I did a full range test and got just over 23 miles on a full charge. That is with a rider weight of about 190 pounds and a constant headwind pretty much the entire way. Since I usually do a range test far out near the beach, there's a headwind coming in off the water in both directions. And so, yeah, I was riding in a headwind the entire way. I hit about 33 miles per hour very, very comfortably, but cruised mostly between 22 to 28 miles per hour. Now, the ride feel of any board often is very personal. However, the ride quality of the UAV is amazing. <laughs> I love the way it rides. Almost as much as this, they're damn near tied. The UAV isn't a bouncy, flexy type of board. It's relatively rigid, but there is a bit of micro flex, especially at the front and the back, just inside of the trucks and there's a layer of dampening foam between the deck and enclosure, and so it actually deadens quite a lot of the road vibration, and it makes for a pretty plush ride. It simply is one of the most pleasing experiences I've had riding an e-skate full stop. The trucks manage to absorb a lot of road imperfections while still offering you a very responsive turn behavior. I don't think I really need to say much about power because it's a high-end board. So it punches really, really hard from the bottom to the top of its speed range. Quite often a symptom of production boards, especially ones that don't use VESC-based controllers, is that they're really punchy right off the line from zero to about 10 or 12 miles per hour. And once you get above that, pretty much all the power is gone, which is a nice parlor trick because if you're demoing it somewhere or someone first gets aboard and they start riding it, that initial punch is very impressive, but that punch just disappears and that's not the case on the UAV. Since the storm core can be configured, it is set up to have a very even power distribution from the lower to the top end of the speed range. 
So like almost everything, there are indeed other options at lower price points. I wouldn't be so naive as to say that the Hoyt Street UAV is the most affordable option for everybody, because that's not true. So there are more budget-friendly options, and then there are options with no compromises, which the UAV is. It is an option with no compromises. It's kind of hard to convey how a high-end board really feels, and I try to prevent myself from getting numb to it since I build boards and I fix boards and I test all different kinds of boards. And so if at some point Hoyt Street is hosting a demo in your area or someone in your area has one for you to demo, you really should try to avail yourself of it because once you actually ride it, everything that I'm explaining becomes very clear. This UAV was a loaner. It was sent to me by Hoyt Street. While most of this video does sound like I'm just gushing about this board, it's because I loved the time that I had with this board and I'm sure that the next person who got it to demo it and review it and do all that stuff is also going to very much appreciate it. And on a more personal note, I really appreciate what Hoyt Street as a company stands for. They have a very present and open support for the community, both those who just buy their products as well as the DIY crowd. Their products are designed to be very easily repaired, not just by them, but by local repair people, which these days I think is worth quite a lot. Anyway, thank you as always for watching. I appreciate your viewership. If you have not subscribed, please do. There is a good amount of both Eastgate and one wheel content on the way. So ride safely, try not to fall, and take care of yourselves.